What's up guys and welcome to the weekly Q&A. Before we get started, I need to say thank you to Reefton, who recently joined Patreon at the Jedi Council level, which is insanely generous, so thank you so much, Reefton. You actually helped us jump above two Patreon goals, and that means I've got audio commentaries for Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith coming very soon. I've been sick for like the past month, it seems, and I don't want the commentaries to be full of coughs, but I will be recording those as soon as I can. Our first question today comes from Michael Fodera, Josh Lowe, and a ton of other people who have all asked me if Kylo Ren built his lightsaber by modifying the one that he used as a Jedi. Yes, I do think that's what's being implied, because the hilts, or at least the very brief look we got at the one that Ben Solo was using, the, the hilts are very similar. So I guess in my mind, I like the idea that he simply bled his own kyber crystal, and it cracked, and so he had to basically gut the thing and add the vents so it wouldn't explode in his hand. Now, he's not a Sith, so he wouldn't be required technically to take up the kyber crystal of a fallen Jedi, but he had plenty of options. He killed a bunch of Luke's students. He thought that Luke was dead. He could have taken any of those kyber crystals and bled them as well. Um, but yeah, I think that the implication is that, yes, he did probably just modify the lightsaber he used as a Jedi. David Harper Jr. asks if there's anything I'm hoping that we do not see in Solo, a Star Wars story. I just did a video on 10 predictions of things I think we will see, and so is there anything I hope that just doesn't appear at all? I hope that Han's service in the Empire is left out. I guess I never was a huge fan of it. It didn't bother me, but I always think of Han as kind of a DJ type character. He's just out in the galaxy for himself and no one else until a new hope happens and he joins something larger than himself. Also, I don't want to see him being too heroic. Again, a new hope was like a turning point for his character where he joined the fight and he risked his neck to save Luke and the Rebel Alliance. So I don't want him to be overly heroic in this upcoming movie. It'd be okay if he did something heroic and it came back to bite him and maybe make him a little more cynical. And a little heroism is okay. Like, he's always been anti-slavery. Uh, that's been a thing since the very, very early Han Solo adventures in Star Wars Legends. And of course, we know he's gonna meet and save Chewbacca. Maybe that won't be as heroic as we think it is, but I expect that he will do some noble things, I just don't want it to go overboard. Because at that point in time, I think he should be a pretty massive jerk. Eric Babcock asks why we don't see the Force being used more frequently in lightsaber duels. Now, he even admits that this does happen here and there, it's just not as prevalent as one might think. First and foremost, cinematically, I think it's just cooler to see lightsabers swinging around than it would be to see an invisible telekinetic battle. But for some in-universe reasons, the Jedi are supposed to use the Force for defense and never attack. They don't exactly follow that rule, but that could be a reason. Also, I would argue that the Force is being used constantly by both parties in a lightsaber duel. It's just in a more passive way. They're using the Force to retain their focus, anticipate their enemies' actions, and keep up their stamina, and so on. So I think that they are using the Force quite heavily while they're fighting, and then to add an attack on top of that would be tough. Marco Atzeri wants to know why the list of Force-sensitive children that was revealed in the latest issue of the Darth Vader comic, why were all those children from planets that we already know about? Does that make the galaxy seem smaller? The thing to keep in mind when it comes to those lists is that they're just meant to be fun. They're little Easter eggs. Like, every or most of the names on that list were just fun Star Wars-y spins on the names of people in the comics industry, or their children, or even their pets. So the planets were probably just assigned arbitrarily, or maybe Charles Soule asked each person, hey, what planet do you want to be from? Or in the case of the pet, it was named after a cat, so they made that character from the planet Cathar. Makes sense. But yeah, those lists are just meant to be fun. They're not meant to do any world building. Nicholas Johnson asks what I think the best aspect of the Star Wars canon is. 
What makes it stronger than Star Wars Legends, and where does it need improvement? I think the best aspect of the canon is the Lucasfilm story group. We have a team of people that are making sure that the stories being told aren't constantly retreading the same plots and the same themes. I can already see the comments saying, well, what about The Force Awakens? It was a retread of A New Hope. And I get that criticism, and I do think that there was a reason for that. I think it was just a business decision. It was their first film out of the gate. They played it safe, and, you know, just do with that what you will. But for the most part, what they're doing is saying, let's make sure that this comic isn't doing the same plot as this book and that that book isn't exploring the same themes as we're exploring in Star Wars Rebels. So when you look back at Legends, we had a bunch of just kind of repetitive plots, like a new super weapon would pop up and Luke and Han and Leia would have to deal with it, or a new Imperial Warlord would pop up and Luke and Han and Leia would have to deal with them. So I think they're just trying to avoid that. But Here's where Legends is better than the canon, and it's just an overall scope and variety. I actually just read the book The Old Republic Annihilation for the podcast Legends Library, which should be coming out on Monday, and that book was incredibly refreshing to read something that was a great story that had nothing to do with the Clone Wars or the Galactic Civil War or the sequel trilogy. Most of the stories being told right now are just kind of like clumped into that same area, where at, in Legends, I can kind of pick and choose whatever I want to read for hundreds of thousands of years of history. Granted, Legends had more than 20 years of stories being told, and I'm sure the canon will get there, but I want the canon to start getting weirder, and I want them to do it a little bit faster than they're doing. Hopefully, Ryan Johnson's trilogy will be be as advertised and will be totally separate from anything we've ever seen. I want that. I want to just get weird with Star Wars and kind of get outside of the realm of the Galactic Civil War, which is what I feel like most of the new stories have been exploring. That's it for patron questions. If you're a patron and you didn't see your question answered here, just head over to Patreon where I left you a written response. If you're not a patron, you can learn more by following the link in the description. Just a dollar a month will get you access to extra Star Wars explained content like audio commentaries for the films, or roles in my Discord server, and the combined donations really go a long way in supporting the channel. On to YouTube questions, Mitwit Gaming asks if I still think that Snoke was the dark side presence Palpatine was sensing in the unknown regions. They kind of go into this in the Aftermath trilogy, and yes, I do think that was Chuck Wendig's intent. So I'm still going to go with that for now, but I am open to that changing in the future. I mean, the statement was vague enough, and the unknown regions are unknown enough that there very well could be something more powerful out there, or just something different that was calling to Palpatine. Iego Alpha wants to know why the First Order didn't just send out hundreds or thousands of TIE fighters to destroy the Resistance fleet right then and there. There was a line in the movie about how the Resistance fleet was too far away and the capital ships couldn't cover their fighters, but, you know, why not just sacrifice a bunch of fighters to wipe them out immediately? I get what you're saying. And I think it all comes down to Hux. First, the dude is incompetent. We can see that in Captain Kennedy's frustration that Hux didn't immediately launch TIE Fighters the second Poe showed up. Also, Hux is sadistic. He gets that from his father. And he's overconfident. He thinks that the destruction of the Resistance is a sure thing. So he was fine to just sit back and psychologically mess with them and chase them down and destroy them one at a time as they were running out of fuel. Droid walks into a bar, asks if the end of The Last Jedi is hinting at all towards a romantic relationship for Poe and Rey. I don't think so, and this has now been stated by cast and crew, but that whole sequence was just about Rey learning that she is not a nobody. Poe introduces himself, she introduces herself, and he goes, I know. People that she thinks are important already know her and think that she is important. So she's now learning that it doesn't matter who her parents were, she is a somebody. 
Tom Gillard wants to know why Luke says he won't be the last Jedi when both he and Yoda agreed it was time for the Jedi to end. To me, I see that as them saying and agreeing that it's time for a reboot. It looks like it's now going to be completely up to Rey to start a new Jedi Order, and she might call it the Jedi Order, but whatever she builds is probably going to be very different from the Order that we saw in the Clone Wars. The next question had some potential spoilers for Solo, a Star Wars story written out, so I'm not going to show the actual image, but the question itself isn't a spoiler. Battle Up Saber asks what I think about the Empire being the villains in Solo, a Star Wars story, and we've known that they would be in the movie since Ron Howard tweeted images of their equipment and Imperial officers. I don't think that necessarily means that they are the main antagonists. I'm sure they will cause some trouble for Han, but considering his line of work, there are so many other options that I would like to see explored. I mean, it could be pirates or bounty hunters or the corporate sector. I could see Woody Harrelson's mentor character kind of turning on Han. So just because we know that the Empire is in the movie doesn't mean necessarily they're going to be the main villains. At least I hope that's not the case. I would prefer to see them do something a little different. That's all the time for questions I have today. If you want to leave a question for next week's video, just put it in the comments below or sign up for Patreon to join our weekly Q&A discussion. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.